Hello everyone, it's Dr. Rocky Gutierrez. Welcome to the anatomy section that I'm actually doing. As you can see, I do have my trusty York on the side. And I am going to talk about the pretty much uh, appendicular skeletal system. Now last time I actually did talk about the axial, all this. I mentioned a little bit about the clavicle. I am going to talk about the clavicle and the uh, scap scapula here again. The scapula is the shoulder blade. And I'm going to talk about the arms today. I may, if, depending on how short it is, talk about the legs. Now one of the things I will tell you is there are some slight modifications that I recommend making to this if you're studying anatomy for an anatomy class. Some of these I will actually make later as I do the muscles. And I will also mention a couple things. One is, I, on the description, I do have a link to a website that has labs that you can actually, worksheets technically, that you can do so with your model you can look at how everything goes. It actually does go a bit deeper into things than what I'm saying on, online. I really intended this more, to be more to help people prepare for anatomy. But if you're taking this, hoping to learn all the anatomy, I did want to give you the uh, worksheets that you would need to start understanding some. For the most part, again, I'm really thinking this would be more for someone before they take anatomy to prepare for it. Now, when we're dealing with the appendicular skeletal system, we actually have a new way to make bone, and I'm just going to mention it a little bit, and it's called endochondral. And one thing to remember is you can break apart the words to tell you what it is. Endo means inside, chondro means cartilage. So this is making bone through cartilage. And what usually happens, and I have a video on that if you're interested, and what usually happens is you make a cartilage skeleton, then the outside of the cartilage, which is called the perichondrium, chondro again means cartilage, peri means around, changes and becomes what's called a periosteum. And the cells around the periosteum, especially in the middle of the bone, so if we were using Yorick's arm here, the area here would actually start calcifying, making what's called a bone collar. The cells that make the bone are called osteoblasts. And I would actually recommend, again, osteo meaning bone, blast meaning maker. So if you actually separate them out, osteoblasts, you know that osteoblasts are going to make bone. And any cell that has blast in it will be making something. So if you have a chondroblast, chondro meaning cartilage, blast meaning maker, it would be a cartilage maker. So around that bone color, you end up making bone using osteoblasts. And the cells inside the bone color, so if we actually had this as cartilage, the cells in here would actually be cartilage, and we'd end up making the bone collar around here. That would kill the cartilage inside, and that's normal. Now, there are, if you notice, I'm actually pointing to the sides here. That means that there's areas up here and down here, which would still have cartilage, and those would continue to grow. Once you have the once you have the osteoblasts make the bone collar, you end up making blood vessels, and some of these blood vessels will carry a special cell called an osteoclast. A clast is something that breaks something down. So an osteoclast breaks down bone. And so in the bone collar, you would end up drilling a hole using these osteoclasts, and then end up sending blood vessels up and down the entire area of the bone. And you remember how we had the osteons being made? Same thing happens on the side, and you have compact bone on the outside, medullary bone, and then you have the medullary cavity in the middle. And so you end up making bone there. That's called the primary ossification center, where it starts. And then you have cartilage form at the tips, here and here. And that, those two would be the secondary ossification centers, and it, things happen exactly like that. And so you actually have bone on one side, you have bone being made here, bone being made here, and cartilage in between. And so the area where the cartilage is, you continue to grow. Those are your growth plates. Eventually, they are going to close, and then the bone quits growing lengthwise. It can still grow outwards. So you have osteoblasts, which are making the bone, osteoclasts, which are breaking it down. And these are actually going to help you remodel the bone. For instance, if you're constantly using the bone, osteoblasts will help make it harder and stronger by adding calcium phosphate crystals in there. If you're not using your bone, the osteoclast will leach out the uh, calcium and phosphate because you don't need to make that strong a bone if you're just sitting around. And so these are going to play in bone health 
later on. Now, the first bones I'm going to talk about are still usually made by endo intramembranous ossification. And that's your bone here, which is your clavicle, and your scapula. And you notice I put a rubber band here, and that's, there's a reason. Now, I talked a little bit about the clavicle, which I'll mention later, and, because I wanted to talk about the scapula. You can see it here and here. And I also want to mention something else that with this uh, skeleton. There is one bone that's missing, and it's actually located right between your uh, mandible, uh, behind your mandible over here, which is your hyoid bone. And you can actually look at a picture and see how it looks. You have a greater, lesser horn and a body. Uh, I do have some videos that talk more about it. In the paperwork, you can actually see what I'm talking about. And so we are going to talk about the pectoral girdle first. Pectoral, pectoralis, the chest area, girdle. It's actually going to come out, and it's going to hold your arm. Now, before we really start talking about the arm, your arm here, we actually have to talk about two new things. Now, I already mentioned how in Yorick you have superior and inferior. You have medial, midline, and lateral, going away from it. You have anterior and posterior. I mentioned all the sutures. In the arms and legs, you also have proximal, which means in proximity, which is usually means it's closer to the, to the torso or trunk, where it's actually going to branch off, and distal, farther away. And those are going to be important when we talk about anatomy and also when we look at muscles and certain projections of bone. One thing I will tell you that I noticed as I went to the smaller areas of bone is there are certain things that are missing in part because of the size. It's still a great model to start with. And when you, if you were to take an anatomy class, you could use that. I will also tell you to use your own body to find out what's going on. So what I'm saying is it's not perfect, but it's good enough that it will work. And one of the first modifications I did is I removed a screw that you can see here on the arm. The reason is the way Yorick sits normally is with the hands having the thumb pointing forward. So you're almost at an attention with your hands if you bent them, thumbs pointing anteriorly. When we are dealing with the muscle, with the body, we usually want to look at it in anatomical position. I'm going to drop this a little so you can see what I'm talking about. In anatomical position, your hands are, thumbs are actually facing forward. And so when you're in an in anatomical position, you can actually see more of the bones that are associated with the body. The big thing with that is it will tell you how we look at the body. And whenever people are talking about anatomy, it doesn't matter if the person's hands are rotated one way or another. It's always referred to an anatomical position. So with that, I did want to start with the clavicle. I'm sorry, the scapula you can see here. Now, if you look closely at the scapula, you'll notice that it is a triangle-shaped bone. And one of the things I am going to do is probably cut it out so I can move it around with muscles. So you have three borders, one border here, one border here, and one up here. Now, the border here is closer to the midline, so we call it the medial border. This one here is closer to the outside, so it would be the lateral border. And then you can see, I'll use Yorick's own arm, over here you have another border, which would be your superior border. As it's a triangle, it also has three angles, inferior, superior, and lateral. Those are actually going to be important because they are places you can see, and you can feel the medial border on yourself. Now, the other thing you see is this big, long projection here. This pre projection is called the spine of the scapula, or the spinous process. And it attaches to this projection that hangs off here called the acromion. So we have the borders, the angles, the spinous process, and the acromial process. And then you have these little di divots here. And anywhere you see a little curve or arch like this, a, a pretty much a, I want to say fossa, it's called a fossa, but any, anywhere you see these little cup-shaped things, they're called fossas. As this fossa is below the spine, it's the infraspinatus fossa, infra for inferior, spinatus for the spinous process, and it's a fossa. Up here, you would have the supraspinatus fossa. And if we were to turn it around, Yorick around, you can see that there's a fossa underneath it here between the scapula and the ribs, and that's a subscapular fossa. The nice thing about this is you can see those really nicely. Acromial, you can see it here, and you can see another process here called the acromium. I'm sorry, the acromium is here. Corcoid process here. You can also see where the cup forms 
which is called the glenoid cavity. And you do have tubercles there and you have a notch, which you can see partially here. I don't know if it'll show up on the camera, but you can see a notch here, scapular notch. And so we actually now have the basics of the scapula. Now, the reason I wanted to mention the scapula is mainly because of this acromial process. Because the acromial process touches the clavicle. And this end of the clavicle, which is on the sternum, is a sternal end. The one that touches the acromion is the acromial end. And you can feel it on yourself. You can feel the sternal end. It has a big rounded projection. And the acromial end is flat. It goes to your shoulder. If you do any sports and you've heard of someone getting a AC tear, they're actually usually talking about the acro in the shoulder. That's the acromial clavicular tear. There's a ligament. It's dense regular connective tissue. It doesn't heal too well, but it connects these two bones. So in you, these bones aren't attached. They're attached with the ligament. And the ACL, uh, the acromial clavicular ligament, is holding those together. You have a lot of ligaments, and usually they are named after the bones it touches. Not always, but a lot of times. So now that we can actually see the scapula, we can see how the humerus goes in. We have our humerus here, which is the bone that makes your upper part or the proximal portion of your arm. So over here, you can see that it has a round air projection called the head. And in the model, it usually has it like this. I took it off because I wanted to come in the way it's supposed to, which is rounded here. The reason, the reason I actually did that also is because you, the joint is a little more of a ball, well, it's a ball and socket joint. It's relatively loose, so it can move around. It has a capsule around it. And anywhere you have two bones come together, usually you have cartilage. You do have cartilage here. You have what's called the labrium, which is a lip, which is fiber cartilage, which actually does help protect the glenoclavicular joint. I'm sorry, the uh, glenohumeral joint. And that's going to allow a lot of movement. It's a ball and socket joint. Now, if you look at it here, you'll notice that you have projections on the bone. On the lateral side of the bone here, you can see a big bulky projection. And then a little more medial and anterior, you have a smaller. These two are called tubercles. And those tubercles, as one's bigger and one's smaller, we call it the greater and lesser tubercle. And between it, you do have a fossa or sulcus. And so you have the inner tubercle sulcus or inner tubercle fossa. You have the head, and between the head and the tubercles, you can see a little line. And one of the things with this bone, it has two necks. You have the anatomical neck, which is between the gleno, the uh, humoral head and the tubercles, and the surgical neck, which is down here. Now, the way a lot of my students meant remember it is A before S. So anatomical neck first, then the surgical neck here. And you can see the tubercles here. As you go down, it doesn't show too well, but you have a little projection on the side here, on the lateral side, which is called a deltoid tuberosity. Just a little bump, and the deltoid will, will go in there. There's a shaft of the bone, and you have, so you have the mid shaft, which is called the aphysis, and the upper areas, which are called the epiphysis, epi, outer, or top. As you go down, you'll notice you have two wing-like projections on the side, and these are called your epicondyles. Condyles are rounded projections, and on the distal end, the farther end here, of the humerus, you have two projections which don't show up here. One of them is called the is called the trochlea, which is like a spool-shaped projection where the ulna fits in. The other one's a round projection called the capitulum, where the radial head rests next to. This is a radius. Ulna here, radius, which I'll talk a little bit more later. So this is a part where this is actually limited. I am thinking of cutting it, and making it more anatomical, more anatomically correct for people. But the nice thing about this is it shows that the ulna actually comes into contact directly with the humerus. The radius is kind of loose at the distal end of the humerus. Epicondyles, again, are the sides here. Now, if you were to look at the ulna, you would notice that it has a hook. And that hook goes to the back of the humerus. And if you go to yourself and you bend your elbow, you'll notice a projection here. That projection is part of the humerus. That projection is a projection we see back here 
and that's called the olecranon. And as it folds into the humerus, that project the fossa, where the olecranon fits in, is the olecranon fossa. That actually keeps the arm from pretty much falling out of, of position. You will have ligaments in there as well. On the front of it, you can, you can barely make it out here, but you have a little projection that looks like a crown. And so we call it the coronoid process. And the fossa where the coronoid process would go in would be the coronoid fossa. You have the radial head here, and it has a little divot here. And this is nice because you can't actually see part of it. And the radius would fit into the projection, the fossa there, so it's a radial fossa. So we have most of the humerus there. As we go down, again, I mentioned that if you're in anatomical position, you can see the thumb here. The one on the medial side is your ulna. So if you put your hand like this, you take your little finger and put it out, you can actually feel your ulna all the way down the medial side of your forearm. And it ends up the olecranon. Well, Over on this side here, you can see the bump, which is called the head. And you do have a pen-like projection in here called the styloid process. With the, electro, the ulna here, you can see roughly how it runs. And that's pretty much all you're going to see on this. But at least you can tell the ulna, the olecranon here, and how it actually interacts with the humerus and the radius. Now, over here, they fuse the radius and ulna. What's nice is you can see some of the projections. So you can see the round head here. The reason you want a round head of the radius is so your arm can pivot, do this. This motion is called pronation and supination. If I were to hand someone a bowl of soup, they would supinate. If I was trying to hit the back of their knuckles, I'd have them a pronate, so they're prone to take the hair. So you have supination and pronation, which are a couple more moves that I'm going to talk about when we get into muscles. You can also see this big tuberosity in between, radial tuberosity. And you'll notice that, and this actually they did okay, where the Ulna comes in where the ulna is and the radius are at the distal end. The radius is a little bigger. In you, the radius is actually a, quite a bit bigger over here compared to the ulna. You'll also notice that they connected the bones of the wrist called the carpals with the radius. The reason is that's actually the way it goes. Most, most of the weight, if you're doing a push-up, will be from your carpals to the radius, and it'll actually cross over almost mid-shaft to the ulna. The reason is anatomical position. Your arms would be like this. When you pronate, the radius crosses because of its head here. Now, collectively, the bones of the wrist are called the carpals. There's a couple bones you can break there, scaphoid, which is the one that has the most contact with the radius. And next to the carpals, you can't see it on the hands here. There you have the bones that make the, pom the pomary. And these are called your metacarpals. You have five, one, two, three, four, five. And they are actually discussed as the first, the second, the third, the fourth, and the fifth. As we go beyond, in this, you can actually, see, I don't know if you can see it on camera, but you can see there, you can see that most fingers have three phalanxes, phalanges. They're phalanges completely. So you have the proximal, the distal, and the middle. Proximal because it's closer to where the body would, where the trunk would be. Distal because it's farther away. The thumb's a little different. If you look at the thumb, you see the metacarpal here. And then you see two phalanx phalanges, one, two. So you just have the proximal and distal. And that's pretty much what you have with the arm. So I will do a little bit on the leg. Shouldn't be that bad. Again. If you look at York, the way his hips are, they actually have a screw that goes in there. So you can put it in here and you'll have limited movement. But the truth is, the bones of the hip actually move in multiple ways. And so I took it out so you could see, when I go into muscles, how muscles will act to move the leg around in the hip. So the first thing I would actually talk to you about is this arch here. This entire bone is called the os coccyx, the pelvis, and you have three bones that fuse. The one down here, this one here, the first one, would be the ilium back here, 
the bone you're sitting on is the ischium, and up in front, you have the pubis. You also see a big hole here called the obturator foramen. You can see it? If I put it, if I there it is. You can see the hole, obturator foramen. So as you now have three different bones there, you can actually look at a lot of different things. They do have the gluteal lines, which is nice. Iliac crest is this crest here. And you'll notice that you have one, two spikes coming off the front of the ilium. So they're the superior and inferior iliac spines. And in the back, you can see here you have two also, one up here and two here. So you have the posterior, posterior superior iliac spine, posterior inferior iliac spine. And these are held by ligaments to the sacrum. You can also see the nice thing is that it shows you the true pelvis here and the false pelvis. I'm sorry, the false pelvis, which is up here, and the true pelvis, which is the opening here. Uh, this one technically would be male because you can see it's a triangle shape, but uh, in this type of model, it'd probably be a little harder. You then end up going to the back, which is your ischium. And in your ischium, you can actually see the two, two a spine here, which is your iliac spine. You see two notches called the sciatic notches, the greater and lesser sciatic notches, ischial tuberosity, and the pubic. Now in this, it didn't actually show it, but you do have cartilage, fiber cartilage, between the two pubic bones here. It's not fused together. It's cartilage there. And... That's actually important because sometimes people have actually broken that either through severe trauma or childbirth. In childbirth, you can actually break it uh, by having the child going through being too big. You also do see the area where the femur is gonna go in, which is called the acetabulum. Now, if you look at the cup for the humerus and you look at the cup for the femur, you'll notice that the cup for the femur tends to be more tight. It's actually tighter than this. This one's actually really loose. And what it, it means is you're not going to have the mobility in the hip that you would have in the glenohumeral joint, but you also have less chances of dislocation. So I'm going to put the Yorick Beck and just deal with his leg. Now, again, there's a lot you can see in this model, which I really like, and it's going to be really important when we do when I do muscles, you can see the head. In this case, you only have one neck. And you can see that there are two bumps here. And these two are called the trochanters. This one's bigger, so it's a greater. This one here is a lesser. You can kind of see the trochanteric crest and the trochanteric lines. You can go down and you can see a little bit of the a line here called the uh, linea aspera. And you get to the lower portion of the knee. Now this part here, is called the popliteal uh, fossa. This is a patella, which they attached it to the femur. Again, I would have actually not put it there. I would have attached it some other way, but this works. And on the sides, you can see a little, couple little lumps called the medial and lateral epicondyles. So these are the condyles. Outside, you have the epicondyles. And this would not be attached like this. It would be attached with ligaments, which I will talk about ligaments next time. And you can feel some of these in your body. If you go to your hip, where you have a little divot, you can feel the greater trochanter. On the sides of the knee, you can feel the epicondyles. And the back is your popliteal fossa. And if you look at how the leg works, you'll notice, I'm going to bring this down a little so you can see a little, you'll notice that most of the force is on this big bone here. That big bone is called the tibia. And you can feel the medial portion of the tibia as it goes all the way to your ankle where you have that bump. That bump looks like a hammer to some, someone, so we called it the medial malleolus. On the opposite side, you have the lateral malleolus. But the tibia is actually really important. You can see that it has a flat area, the plateau, and it does have a little projection going up, not quite this big and not, not attached. Well, it's attached by ligaments, which is called the inner condylar eminence. You have two condyles, so intercondylar eminence goes between them. You also have a little bump in the front of the knee here. You can probably feel it on yourself better than you can see it here, which is called the tibial tuberosity. And sometimes little kids in particular can tear it off if they're exercising too much. So you have the tibia. Now, next to it, you have this little bone. 
called the fibula. You have the tibia and the fibula. The way to remember it is a fib is a little Y, so the little bone that lies next to the tibia is the fibula. And you have the lateral epicondyle here. If you feel it, it's on the lateral side of your leg. You can have the head up here. So you can see the head comes in here. You can feel it on yourself. And you'll notice that the tibia is a lot bigger than the fibula. Then you're going to go to your feet. And the first bones of the feet here are called your tarsals, collectively. You have a lot of them, and it does make an arch. And I have more labs if you want to look at that. And the tarsals, which are the bones that make the back of the foot, technically they call them the uh, bones of the ankle, they are going to be where you mainly put force. And if you go into walking, you'll see how those bones pretty much pivot a little, slide a little, it's a plane joint. And so you can actually move your feet in certain ways. Well, just like your hands, your tarsals are next to these bones here, which are your metatarsals. And your hands are the metacarpals, metatarsals. And your toes are just like your fingers. Phalanges, you have three on all of them, but your first, your big toe only has two. You have the distal and the proximal. The others are exactly like the fingers. So that's actually the basics of the skeletal system. I hope you enjoyed this. I hope you got something out of it. And like I said, I think this model is really worthwhile. When I do the muscles, I am going to use clay so you can so you can see where the muscles would go. I'm not going to talk about all of them because talking about every muscle tends to be a bit uh, long. And a lot of times by actually getting the clay and working it, trying to find out where a muscle originates from and where it inserts, you'll learn a lot more. Now, the way you actually use this is where a muscle originates it is usually where it's pulling from. So it's not going to be doing a lot of movement there. Where it inserts is where it's going to pull. And so you're going to have these actions because of how muscles pull. When I do this, I am going to do some of the muscles of the head and neck. And I'm going to do some of the more important ones for anatomical landmarks, which should help you if you're taking anatomy class, give you orientations. I will, again, will not go over all of them. I may talk about, actually, I will talk about more of them as I go into uh, kinesiology and how the body moves. But uh, for now, that's it. I will have the labs on the uh, website that I have in the link. And I would recommend getting the model and some Play-Doh if you want to follow along so you can see what you're doing. Hope you enjoy this and have a nice day.